ladies and gentlemen, just like to welcome you all to um, this uh, uh, live interview with uh, actor Stephen Baldwin. And um, the, this uh, interview and Q&A will be in two parts. Um, today we'll be focusing on uh, Stephen's personal testimony. And uh, part two, which will be tomorrow, will be focusing particularly on his, his works, particularly his two latest films, which are uh, I'm in Love with a Church Girl and Loving the Bad Man. So I'd like to introduce uh, Stephen Baldwin, and who will be interviewed by Paul Carenza, who is a stand-up comedian and also a comedy writer for Miranda, if you've seen that on BBC TV, uh, uh, among others. So uh, welcome, Stephen, and welcome, Paul. Thank you, thank you, Ray. Thank you, hello, Stephen. How are you doing? We should do the formal handshake. Nice, yeah. After you. you. Well, thank you very much. Thank very you. good of you. Are you happy that side? Could have. Make sure that could have uh, been a very awkward moment just there. Who's going to sit down first? And it would have been, wouldn't it? All of that. We both sat, chose the same chair. That and we're not going to launch into like a comedy routine. <laughs> it would have made for an odd interview. I would it? love to do that. Um, we may yet. But that's tomorrow. Who knows? Who but knows? But hey, um, Ray, there you go. Thank you, brother. Everyone, please forgive me. I'm. Uh, fighting uh, uh, bad allergies. Uh, I like to joke with myself and say that I'm pursuing Jesus in such a great way that uh, the the realm of this world is just like I'm allergic to it now. Clearly. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's a good place to be. But, but obviously that would be an exaggeration. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, just, just ask, <laughs> just ask my wife. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, we're delighted. Well, we're delighted. You've you've made it in, uh, uh, in in sickness and in health. We're probably not the best thing if it's allergies to surround you with grass and hay. Um, but here we are. Um, and uh, uh, so, how long have you been in the UK in the, in this particular stint? Then, are you sort of uh, brand new off the plane today, or have you been here for a, a, a little stint? No, I I've just about. Just got here day before yesterday. Right. Took a very long evening flight. Landed oh. early in the morning, but no, just arrived mm -hmm. here and uh, uh, here for three, four days for this, and then right. I, I, I'm actually this is the start of kind of a crazy mm. international run. From here, I go to the Philippines, and then I go to Mumbai, India, and then I go to Istanbul to perform as an actor in a film there, and then I go home. Wow, so, I mean, obviously, we've got the, we've got the, the, the banner here, Loving the Bad Man, we'll be talking about that a little bit today, maybe more so tomorrow as well. Um, and uh, I'm in Love with the Church Girl, is the other film, uh, particularly on this tour. And so, um, many people will have uh, seen you in films, uh, The Usual Suspects, and uh, um, uh, many films over the years, looking at your IMDb page, which, of course, we all know is infallible and must be 100% accurate. Um, <laughs> And indeed, Wikipedia as well. You know, who knows about these things? But I, but I think I'm DB listed. You have, you've done about I think about three off a hundred roles or something like that. It's it's yeah. you've done a lot of films, haven't you, uh, over well, the years? It, and it's funny you mentioned this because last week somebody had said to me, "Oh, you know, we're, we were chatting," and they said, "Oh, this or that about mm. that film you did." And so I had to go look up the film to remember what it was. And on the home page of, of Stephen Baldwin on IMDb, it says, you know, actor, 90 films. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I literally, that's me. And I'm sitting there going, wow, you've done 90 films. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had no idea. Does it feel like that? Does it feel like, is it, is it sort of blink and it's happened? Or, uh, you know, how's it been? Because you started out in, uh, there's some t I was looking at you, some, some TV roles to start with. Um, and, uh, and then uh, the breaking through in the early 90s. Um, it's been, a, it's been a few decades now, hasn't it? And does it yeah. sort of feel like that? Does it, how's it been for you? Well, the, the, the kind of weird part is um, in the last 10 years, it has slowed down so much uh, just because the Christian film industry obviously is where it's at in its existence. Uh, and the opportunity just, you know, is what it is. And... Um, for me, when when I first became a born again Christian, uh, it, it was it was a strange position to be in, because I had all of those relationships from secular Hollywood that understood that there was an audience and there was uh, content and there was money to be made. You know, so so that's the Hollywood guys. You know, yeah. that's really their 
modus operandi there, so, um, which is understandable. And then you have simultaneously the Christian filmmakers that are saying, like, how do we do our thing that allows it to infiltrate all of the secular aspects of Hollywood and uh, hopefully, for the most part, uh, the, the, the Christian film industry is trying to do that thing where it engages Hollywood uh, with the motivation of uh, improving in its excellence and production value and things like that. So uh, strangely to me, um, even uh, when Passion of the Christ uh, had the success that it did, which the truth be told, in, in my opinion, because you can have a perception of uh, Hollywood filmmaking and how it works and what it is, and, and it's not at all what you think it is until you've lived it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the the, the single-handedly Passion of the Christ uh, only occurred and was, you know, in the end result, as successful as it was because of Mel. That's just, that's the bottom line. Um, and Mel's faith, uh, actually. He, he just had a vision. Uh, in his mind, God kind of showed him what to do. Uh, and then spent 30 million of his own dollars to do it, uh, and and uh, the reaction was what it was. So after that, you would think, uh, since then, re really the only big, full-on biblical event film is now Noah, mm -hmm. almost uh, close to 10 years later. Uh, you would think that Hollywood would have mm -hmm. jumped on that bag bandwagon a little bit quicker. And and for me, what I believe. Uh, and I'll kind of circle back to the beginning of the question, is uh, I really believe that uh, in God's timing in all of this, uh, his ways are not our ways. And and, uh, and as much as, because even 10 years ago when I first got into Christian film, you know, I had all kinds of crazy ideas and you, you could do this and you could do that. And, and uh, only right now is the independent Christian film industry trending and quantum leaping right now. So now, in my mind, is the time for anybody and everybody that's interested in being involved or uh, trying to figure it out. Or now is the time for the independent Christian film industry to flourish. Um, so at the beginning of that process for me 10 years ago, uh, th there really wasn't much opportunity, you mm. know. Um, uh, but I did, uh, I was fortunate to be involved in some projects because at the same time there was a lot of stuff that just, sorry, wasn't very good, mm. you know. And uh, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 I'll, I'll have a little fun with everybody right now. Uh, you can't imagine how odd it is three times a month when somebody comes up to me and says, you know, I prayed about it, and God told me to tell you, <laughs> you're supposed to be in my movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what do you say to that, then? How do you sort of... Uh, I yeah. tell them, I'm going to pray about that, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'll call you as yeah. soon as I hear that same thing. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Um, but uh, no, and, 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 mm. and truth be told, I have been involved in some very small Christian projects that didn't pay me anything or, mm. or close to it um, just because of who was involved and what it was about and, and the prayer that I, you know, experienced in, in making that decision. Um, so it, for me, it's not only about, oh, be Stephen Baldwin, the Hollywood guy who's now a follower of Jesus and only do X, Y, and Z that's good for your career. Mm. Uh, I, I like to try to do things that I believe will speak to people about the faith. Mm. That that's the thing that I find the most compelling. Yeah, yeah. So this, I mean, this year it does, like you say, with Noah, we've just had over here, and then I think um, Exodus is coming out in December, <coughs> I think, with you know, Ridley Scott big movies. So, do you think is Hollywood now listening? Is they are they sort of you know, cause obviously it's a money it's a money game, <laughs> um, and these films are making money. So presumably, uh, are we going to see next few years books of the Bible sort of? more of them translated on the screen, and equally, of course, uh, films like, you know, that aren't necessarily biblically, uh, you know, retelling of a Bible story, but have these Christian through lines, like Loving the Bad Man, I'm in Love with the Church Girl. Um, 
is, are we going to see this big change? Do you think in Hollywood? Is it a fad, or how do we? How do you sort of see this going? No, I, I, I definitely think in the next five years, even that mm. quickly, uh, the specific to films like I'm in Love with the Church Girl, Loving the Bad Man, th those little independent Christian faith-based films, you're going to just see hundreds of them start mm. flooding the market. Because what, what's fascinating is. What's happening in Christian cinema now is what happened in secular independent cinema in the last 15, 20 years. And that is when the individual uh, was empowered and figured out that they could circumvent the studio system, when you could make a movie and raise the money and take the movie into a theater by yourself, that really you know, was a wake-up call for uh, the studio system, so to speak. So that's why those guys are kind of snapping up little indie films at film festivals and things like that, and they, they still do what they do, um, and they will always exist. But um, it, it's an interesting option and a freedom for individuals to, to self-distribute. Um, exactly in that same way. I mean, I'm in conversations with three different groups right now that are Christian individuals that are basically building, one of them is a film fund at $100 million uh, that, that is very serious and the funding's coming out of China and so on and so forth, and it's to build a Christian studio, uh, not, not, not the bricks and mortar, but to create a, a, a business that would allow for the in-house, under one roof, independent creation, production, and distribution of films, publishing, music, all of that. Mm. Um, because now is the time. And um, uh, it's exciting, but, but even more exciting for me, and I'm probably gonna get in a little trouble for this. Um, <laughs> Don't say it. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm one of the only guys that went to the NOAA premiere. Uh, because in America, you know, there was all kinds of a controversy around the film, a a as there should have been. You know, this director, Darren Aronofsky, who... Uh, uh, see, I'm not one of these Christians that believes, oh, you know, well, if they're not a Christian, or this, you know, well, then you can't this or that. And my wife would disagree with me, which is <laughs> interesting. Um, uh, but, but, and all that is, uh, you know, is, is debatable on levels, you know what I mean? But... Um, uh, I don't think you can say about a guy like Darren Aronofsky that he's not talented and doesn't have vision and doesn't make beautiful films. The content or subject you could disagree with, but it doesn't, it doesn't take away from his ability. Um, so uh, I'm kind of, uh, I'm a Christian evangelistic troublemaker. <laughs> A rouser of rabble. That's what yeah, we well, yeah, I, used, I, I tell people I used to yeah. be trouble in this world. Now I'm trouble to this world, which yeah. is <laughs> which is kind of fun. Um, but I was excited because it, it, in the reality of what was happening with Noah and with so many uh, big-time Christian organizations uh, coming against the film, uh, I'm somebody that just simply said, well, A, shouldn't we see the movie first, you know, mm. before you yeah. judge something, number one. And number two, uh, I believe, particularly in America right now, how the body of Christ reacts to certain things publicly really will dictate how we are received uh, through Absolutely. and through. Yeah. Um, so I, I, d I wanted to see the film. I thought the film was amazing. Uh, and I think more interestingly than anything else, all that was happening with Noah in America was allowing for the conversation of Christ. Mm. Uh, at, at a time where, you know, secularism is kind of, you know, this giant blanket that's, you know, covering America right now. So uh, uh, for me, um, in addition to what I expressed with independent film, I think you're going to be seeing a lot of big event, high budget studio films that are coming in the next five to 10 years as well that are David and Goliath, you know, straight on, 
biblical films, and I think that's exciting too. That's great. It's great. And I think I, it's always that controversy. Whenever you put the Bible on screen, some people are going to like the version they get, and some aren't. And but at least it starts that conversation with people, and it's right. It's fantastic, isn't it? And then so even so, at the, at the maxi level, at the million million multi million dollar level, these things are, are exciting <coughs> and happening. And then of course, as you were saying before the. Um, at the small level, you can anyone can pick up a camera now, and for a few thousand pounds or dollars, they can make a movie. And there's a guy I was chatting to yesterday who was interested in doing that with his church. And would you say then people here today who maybe want to act or write or direct, uh, not only is it a good time for the Christian thing, but in terms of technology, people can do this now, and is it it's, it seems feasible? Do you think to actually make your own film, get it out there to a degree? Yeah, I, un, you know, unquestionably, uh, particularly in America right now, um, the the because in in the wake of these two pastors, the Kendrick brothers, who did uh, facing the giants, fireproof and courageous, which um, fireproof was made, I think for between five hundred thousand and a million dollars, and it made over thirty million at the box office. Uh, and uh, that was with Kirk Cameron. And that is obviously uh, uh, an anomaly, but it, but it had to do with this ability in America that we're seeing right now within marketing and promotion to directly get the church behind you know, certain opportunities. Uh, that, that's a big trend that's allowing for this opportunity as well. Um, and, and then kind of in, in a staggering way uh, on the publishing side of fireproof uh, the film made 300 million dollars so for a $500,000 budgeted film you know for the fireproof bibles and curriculum and study guides worldwide translated into every language blah 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 to make 300 million i mean that's it's almost mm -hmm. unbelievable wow. yeah. um so the kendricks you know really after Mel Gibson, the, the Kendrick brothers, un, you know, unquestionably really should be credited along with Kirk Cameron for kind of kicking that door open again. Uh, and now you're seeing uh, uh, a wave and a trend of many, many churches in America funding their own independent feature films. I'm, I'm almost constantly in a conversation with different churches that are either offering me an opportunity or inviting me to consult them on it or you know uh, ask you know lend a hand about about how to how to get it done um, but I, I kind of enjoy giving back to young people and students in particular so what I would say to a lot of uh, Christians here in England where uh, if you're a person of faith and unless it's some overwhelmingly uh, uh, proselytizing situation. If you had some, uh, let's call it faith friendly or family friendly or you know morally responsible, call it whatever you want. If it's not some obvious Jesus, Jesus, Jesus film, uh, but there was some message of faith uh, symbolically, I think that unequivocally many of the colleges in England have filmmaking divisions with students. And if you had an idea and you already had a story or a treatment, you could go create partnerships with colleges here in England that, that they want those opportunities. They, they want to engage the students in that way and al allow them to have that experience. So that would be uh, a str I've done that with Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida. I've directed two projects over there. And I just, the, the kids wrote it. I gave them the idea. They wrote it. I oversaw the whole thing. And then... They had a director of photography, they had all the equipment, they had everything. Uh, so th that's another Brilliant. way of yeah. getting it done. Great, great. Um, let's quickly then just look back uh, at your own story of faith and how you came to, to uh, you know, now you're, you're a big player in Christian media and these things, getting making these things happen, which is fantastic. So how did it come about then? Because I, I believe you grew up in a, your family was Catholic growing up, was that right? Yeah. So was there always this sort of a background of faith before <laughs> you... Uh, became a sort of born again uh, in more recent times? Well, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I was born into the Roman Catholic faith, and it was 
uh, at that time for who I was and where I was from, it was more of a mechanical mm. kind of existence. Um, uh, I was an altar boy for five minutes. Uh, uh, I, I can't remember why I was invited not to be an altar boy anymore. Um, but it had something to do with something uh, questionable. Uh, you know, I may have, you know, like when your parents go out of town and you throw that party or... I might have done that in okay. a sanctuary. Okay, you know, okay, that, that'll that'll do it. Probably that'll wasn't it. a good idea, but uh, sorry, Tomas. Um, uh, but uh, I I went through that experience up until I don't know age eleven or twelve, uh, and then when you get into middle school and and stuff like that, um, it was something that uh, just just uh, I didn't gravitate towards, uh, which I believe. For me, you have to kind of go through what you go through to um, come back around and yeah. uh, uh, commit to what you're gonna, to, to what's gonna work for you. Um, uh, and uh, I wrote a book about this. Uh, my biography is called The Unusual Suspect, uh, which is a play on the title there from the film I did called The Usual Suspects. Uh, and, and, and all of this is, uh, wonderfully told in the book, and uh, I say that just because Mark Tabb, my co-writer, uh, uh, really kind of captured the whole scenario pretty well in a, in a very beautiful way, and it's very humorous. Uh, hope you like that sort of thing. <laughs> um, and uh, so probably from, you know, middle school through high school, and then once I graduated high school, I moved into New York City, started uh, pursuing the acting because my older brother had already been doing it. Uh, I was pretty much on my own, mm. pretty much uh, doing my own thing, right. just running around and yeah. uh, doing what you do when yeah. you're clever and uh, yeah. charming. Did you get was that were there the trappings of uh, of the sort of the Hollywood uh, the lifestyle and did you sort of feel in whether. You know, as you said, your older brother was already acting by that point. Did you kind of feel, oh, this is a good life. We could have a bit of this. And before you then uh, found Jesus, so how, how was how were those years for you encountering that? Well, as I as I said, uh, uh, why I enjoyed uh, the how the book turned out uh, is in the process of writing my book, I, I would just sit for hours and hours and hours and just tell stories about my life to Mark Tab. And he would record them, and then you know he would translate them later, and then we, we would build chapters out of that. But it was fascinating to go through that process and kind of in the looking back or the retrospective of your life, it's interesting when the Holy Spirit is with you to then see the hand of God. It, it, and it, it's, it's really amazing uh, in that respect. And, um, and, there were, and there's so many kind of crazy aspects of that uh, demonstrated in the book. Um, but uh, for me, uh, certainly, when I moved into New York City, probably around uh, age 18 and a half, 19, I had been going to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York City, but commuting from Long Island, taking the train every day to do that. But then I took the plunge and moved into the city, and I was working as a waiter and working at a pizzeria and you know doing all that stuff you do when you're first trying to break into the business and um, certainly to what you just said uh, when you do start to get into the acting business and the filmmaking business and making you know even early on sums of money that were dangerous you know uh, because uh, when you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars in your early 20s uh, and you're working in an industry that kind of breeds uh, a certain lifestyle of um, excess and things like that uh, it's pretty normal to get caught up in it yeah yeah um, yeah it's understandable but and obviously you, you are one of so your four your three brothers are all actors as well and um, uh, but I'm, I'm right in thinking that your your parents. I think I think of the Baldwins as an acting dynasty. It must have been acting for several hundred years. But but your your generation was the first to be acting. Was that right? So your parents, um, uh, but weren't actors as well. Right. Is that right? right. Yeah. Um, 
and so you were kind of learning as you go along, I suppose, from the trappings of this, that you, you were sort of uh, uh, finding out by doing it. Is that, is that fair to say? Oh, yeah. No, uh, my, my dad was a, a school teacher out on Long Island, and uh, my mom was uh, a homemaker, and uh, my eldest brother was going to George Washington University for political science and just had a change of heart and came back to New York and started to go to NYU and uh, study at the Lee Strasberg School of Acting, uh, which really frustrated my dad. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the long story short is Alec, just from being in the city and working as a waiter at nightlife and just interacting with people in the industry, inevitably uh, landed the opportunity of auditioning uh, for a very famous, at the time, popular daytime soap opera called The Doctors, uh, which was very successful in America, and then basically has never stopped working yeah. since. We have one here called Doctors, but it's not quite as good. It's, uh, oh, yeah? it's more low budget, I think, our, our one. Oh, America does it a lot better than we do. You know, uh, yeah. No, this one was pretty low budget, too. Right. Right. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, but then after that, I uh, did a, a, a progression of television films and then uh, a, a very, very successful TV series called Knots Landing in America, which was kind of like yeah, Dallas yeah. and Dynasty and, yeah. and stuff like that, w which, very interesting, he played the role of an evangelist on that program. Right. Isn't that something? Okay, okay, there you go. Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, so, uh, so uh, you know, for me uh, and for Daniel, my other brother, and my brother William, uh, it was all kind of this thing where we, we grew up in a very aggressive, blue-collar, kind of Friday night lights crazy, American, macho, patriotic existence. Right. Uh, so when Alec first broke into the business, the, the other three boys were kind of looking at him like, well, if, if that dope can do it, well, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the, the, the rest of us surely can give it a try. Um, and that's the beginning of it. And, yeah. and that's not to say that... Uh, it's entirely a fluke, but I mean, you, you do have to have the ability uh, in order to get the work uh, and certainly to have the longevity. You, you, you have to figure out the industry as well because that's the fun I get to have with young people today. I get to say to them, excuse me, uh, really don't pursue the film industry for any other initial motivation than you really love uh, with a passion uh, uh, the opportunity of either acting, writing, directing, whatever it is, or, or creating film. Uh, it's gotta, there's got to be a love uh, in that dynamic. And then never forget in all of this experience that it's called show business. Uh, and what's the first word? Show. And what's the second word? Business. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people get uh, very forgetful of that, and um, uh, they they really suffer a lot of frustration and uh, rejection and things like that. Uh, but that whole thing only comes with experience. Mm. Yeah. Um, so great. So you. So all four of you then. Uh, you know, you, you were acting then, and I think uh, yourself and two of your brothers were in the same film, Born on the Fourth of July. Is that right? Three of us. Three of three of you are in that as different, uh, not as brothers. Is that right? As not at all. Not no. As, no. Wow. Yeah. Um, and um, and then uh, and yeah, it's, I mean, odd to think. I, you know, um, one brother was in uh, was Homicide: Life on the Streets, I think, uh, and then another was in Sliver, which anyone seen Sliver, you shouldn't have done. Naughty Christians. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, and then in the nineties, then so you're doing The Usual Suspects and and Biodome and and indeed Barney Rubble in The Flintstones, Rock Ve Viva Rock Vegas. How about that? Oh yes, very good. Um, and this is all before you uh, you became a, a, a Christian uh, in uh, more recent times, is that? Uh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I um, did Usual Suspects. Uh, that kind of popped pretty seriously. Uh, quite shockingly, I, I, I'll, I'll never forget, I did Usual Suspects and within about two or three weeks after the film, was in theaters. I get this. <laughs> I get this phone call. Jerry Bruckheimer would like to see you, and I was like, <laughs> "No, seriously." 
And uh, yeah, yeah. I, I went and had this meeting with Jerry Bruckheimer, and uh, and he was like, you know, hey, good to see you, and the movie's great, and you were great, and great, and this is great, and uh, you know, really, the thing that you need to be aware of now is it's it's about choices. It's about the choices you now make when you're in this position that determine where where it's going to go and how it's going to go and this and that. So um, the next big movie uh, after Usual Suspects was this picture called Biodome with uh, Pauly Shore uh, that probably politically was not the right, <laughs> right. next okay. best choice. But I've never lived my life that way. Yeah. Uh, I just, I'm not that kind of guy. I just... Uh, I have to follow my instincts and my intuition. And uh, th the other thing I share with young people about filmmaking is, you know, uh, in that love and in all of that is, uh, y if you're not going to have fun, mm -hmm. what's the point? Um, and I get a kick out of telling this story because I, I, I did. The Biodome is basically like a Dumb and Dumber uh, with me and this young comedian in America named Pauly Shore, who's quite famous. In the 80s, he was very successful uh, with a series of comedy films. And um, I was a huge fan of his, because uh, he's a very silly person. <laughs> um, so I get this phone call, and it was after Usual Suspects, and they say, you know, we're doing this movie, Biodome. And uh, in Arizona, they have this... Uh, structure called the biosphere if you all know what that is well so it's the story of the basically they're launching something like the biosphere and these scientists are going to go into this building for one year and live in it and see the effects of living in a safe environment and blah 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 blah. and paulie shore and i play these two kind of derelicts basically who accidentally get locked into the dome with the scientists for the year it's a great idea sure yeah it's brilliant cinema. <laughs> but uh, I get offered this picture, and they offered me a ridiculous amount of money, uh, and I called Alec. And I said to my brother Alec, I said, now listen, you know, uh, uh, everything's going very well, and uh, I met Jerry Bruckheimer, and it's, he told me it's about the next choice, so I uh, just want to bounce this off you. I said, uh, there's this picture, and it's called Biodome, and Pauly Shore, and, you know, and this is what it's about, and they're offering me X amount of money, and that's a lot of money, and it would really be funny, and who knows, it could be a big hit, right? So well, what do you think? And uh, I, I do somewhat of a decent impersonation of my big brother, but literally there was a long pause <laughs> on the other end of the phone, and <clears throat> my brother goes like this. He goes, Biodome. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's it. He goes, <laughs> You and Polly Shore <laughs> trapped in a biodome. I said, Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? He said, I think that's the greatest career ending decision <laughs> you could possibly make. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so, of course, I did the movie. Of course, of course. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to go watch it tonight. It'll be yeah. Great. yeah, we're going to yeah. screening it's, later. Uh, yeah. It's a very It'll funny film. Uh, and uh, No, but I, 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 that's just a, a, mm -hmm. a funny story, and mm -hmm. it's a true story. And um, since all of that, all of those bigger films that were the ones that were... I did another one with Lawrence Fishburne called Fled that was very successful. Mm -hmm. I did another film with Mario Van Peebles called Posse that was very successful in America. And... Um, uh, the, the interesting thing is, and, and probably we'll talk more about the specifics of this tomorrow, but um, uh, when life and the circumstances of life uh, happen and you have uh, some kind of a, a, a sensibility or a perception that it's something God is doing, I'm somebody who's always believed that you should pay attention to that. Um, so all of what you and I have communicated today uh, has kind of taken a little peek at different aspects of that. 
But what's fascinating for me is, um, and I get a kick out of this, we were just, my friends and I at breakfast who are here, we, we were just talking about this this morning, which is um, when you're really in this walk and this journey of, of the Christian faith, uh, and and the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, is in your life as it should be. Um, then there's there's a whole lot about it that you're never going to fully understand. You know, there's a lot of unexpected aspects uh, of this journey. Um, but what's hilarious to me is, in as much in the last ten years as I've kind of wondered what God was going to do with me. I mean, okay, God, you, you put me in these films, you gave me this talent, and now there's really not an existing Christian film industry, you know, that is meaningful. Well, that was 10 years ago. But now here we are, 2014, and it's becoming meaningful very quickly. Uh, so, it, it again, it's just, you know, we're never going to fully be able to comprehend or understand God's timing and all those things. Um, but I'm just thrilled that um, films like Loving the Bad Man and the one you'll see today, I'm in Love with the Church Girl, uh, which, which, if I may, uh, is an amazing story about a guy named Gally Molina is now a youth pastor in Northern California, but he was a big time kind of uh, rap music producer in, in America, and he got involved in some criminal activity and uh, that led to uh, some potentially serious problems in his life and he did uh, get incarcerated uh, and then met a beautiful girl who was a Christian and whenever Galley talks about it, he says, I'm in love with the church girl is the story of how God used a woman to change a man's life. Uh, and, and it's just an amazing, church girl is very unique and different than most Christian films that have been produced and made in America in the last 10 years. Uh, a, it's starring a rapper from America for, who has been very successful in the 90s named Ja Rule. Uh, ja Rule had two or three or four major number one music hits with Jennifer Lopez in the 90s. He is a very, very famous person. So Galley casting him, knowing that doing that would allow... Uh, for there to be a greater potential for crossover is part of the reason uh, that, that we did all that. So uh, Church Girl, again, even what, when you see the film, you'll get a sense that it, it even in its production value, it looks, looks a whole lot better than most of the Christian films out there right. uh, with the cast and the music and all these things. Uh, this, it, in my opinion... I'm in love with the church girl and films that I'm developing now uh, uh, that we'll be getting into production on uh, in 2015 and 16, that these are the types of Christian films that my heart gravitates towards. Uh, and that is they don't have to be big, fancy, expensive films, mm -hmm. but we should, as Christian filmmakers, be concerned with uh, the idea that the production value and the quality of the films we make should be, uh, as best we can, as excellent as anything that Hollywood has to offer as well, uh, so that uh, those films will have the, mm. the same opportunity as anything else that's out there in the marketplace. That's great. That's fantastic. Um, we're going to have to wrap up in just a, a minute or so, but um, uh, those... Both these films are downstairs at the Christian Film Festival stand, and you can look at the uh, the, the materials there and the, and the DVDs, I believe, as well. Um, so as a parting sort of message then to... Um, we've got loads more we could get into, obviously, <laughs> and we've got tomorrow as well, which is great, so we are going to be able to get <coughs> Do come back tomorrow as well for that. Um, uh, what then... Uh, so people who want to be involved in creating these these films and creating, writing, acting, directing, we've, we've mentioned what they can do. People who may want to... you know, who are film consumers... Um, they can take your films, they can be showing them in their churches, putting on nights, and, and of course they can say they've heard you talking about it, and they can be doing an impression of you, doing an impression of your brother, doing an impression of whatever, and you know, and they can say they've been part of all this. So, sure. um, uh, so is there any part, sort of parting message we can say to people that, um, to encourage in, uh, uh, from your whole journey, obviously, we haven't been able to get fully into um, when you became a Christian, but that was the last sort of 10, 15 years, wasn't it, mm -hmm. I believe? Um, 
what sort of parting message can we give that just encourages people to um, uh, get involved in these sort of uh, media uh, um, moments as well? I would just, uh, I, I think that there are aspects within the industry of things and elements that are revealing themselves right now that are actually going to allow for, in a much greater way, the, the independent person to make films and have those films seen by the masses. Uh, there's a, a, a company that's a Christian film that's a uh, Christian film company that's been around for a while that's actually restructuring itself right now to kind of be a Netflix type of distributor of digital content online. So now uh, I believe that if you feel creatively in your heart and mind that God has given you a story, uh, then I believe you owe it to yourself and God uh, to do all you can to get it out there uh, to get it made. And as I said, you can partner with film schools and do, the, do it with students. and things. There's lots of very innovative ways to get something done. But know this. Uh, these days and in the, in the days to come and in the future 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we never know at all um, what God is doing and how God is doing it. So you may make your little independent Christian film and it may never see a movie theater in its life. But for whatever reason, if it does end up on that Christian version of Netflix mm -hmm. and one person comes to salvation as a result of it That may have been God's plan. Wow. Yeah, so I, I, I would definitely um, Challenge people uh, To consider uh, if, if you're here and and that's part of, of what you feel potentially is uh, your calling and things like that then there, there is no question that now uh, there is no better time than than right now to be thinking about creating content and doing more and more Christian film because now there's a whole mm. wave and a tsunami of activity that's occurring behind the scenes that will support mm. that in, in the next few years to come. Brilliant. That's great. Inspiring, encouraging. We thank you for that. And and if you're making these these films and you you think God is telling you to that Stephen needs to be in this film, just really question that prayer. Just really <laughs> Pretty asked twice. Um, yeah, because the Bible says that even Satan will come as an angel of light. Yeah, let's watch out so. for that. But I'm bum. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Stephen Baldwin, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. And we're back tomorrow for more Thank half you. of that. Thank, Thank you so much. You.